Hello. My name is Sibila and I'm deaf. Welcome to the DLC's annual Deaf Women in History Month celebration. I believe this is our 10th annual celebration to showcase these women. Working at the library, I'd really like to think that the purpose and importance of the library itself is to share information, to educate people, and to really help people become aware. That's why this year we want to really showcase women through history, deaf women throughout history. We want to celebrate the many women from throughout the years who have really rolled up their sleeves, dug in their heels and changed the world for us today. Help pave the way for those of us women today. We're gonna showcase each woman and their, their successes and their sufferings and, their, and what they've been through. We will share their stories later. The goal is really to share their stories, their information, so that young women in the deaf community can really look up at these role models and learn they can do it too. And we're thankful for that. Today, we really hope to share this information that can empower so many women. We tip our hats in honor to each woman who has come before us today to inspire us and to change the battle and break down the barriers for us. We are so grateful. Our lives are easier because of you. This event is supported by Pinellas Public Library Cooperative and the Deaf Literacy Center, partnering with the UF Signing Gators ASL Club. We are so thankful to recognize five women in a panel today. They were willing to join us via Zoom to share their stories with us today. Thank you so much. We'd also like to say thanks to our mediator this evening and she will introduce our panel later. Also a big thank you to our sign language interpreters. Thank you. Our mediator this evening is Ms. Yari Santiago. We now celebrate the women who have come today and we turn it over to Ms. Yari Santiago, our mediator. Thank you. Hello, hello everyone. My name is Yari Santiago. I will be your moderator for the event this evening. We do have five deaf women on our panel this evening. I will share my screen, which will begin with a PowerPoint, and then we'll move to the panel so we can hear the wonderful stories of these five beautiful women. What an exciting event. I'll tell you first a little bit about myself. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. I did move to the US and attended the School for the Deaf where I graduated in Florida. I have many accomplishments I could mention. Currently, I am an ASL professor at University of Florida. Go Gators. And of course, I love all of my students. They're all so bright and eager to learn. So now, let me share my screen with the PowerPoint. Hello, welcome to Deaf Women in History Month. 
the Deaf Literacy Center and the University of Florida. ASL Gators are pleased to host this event this evening. We're going to talk a little bit about deaf women in our history and some important fascinating facts. First, we have Alice Cogswell. She was the first student at Gallaudet's American School for the Deaf. On this slide, we have Juliet Gordon Lowe. She is hearing, but at the age of 17, she began to lose her hearing as a young adult and then later became deaf. She is noted as the founder of the Girl Scouts of America. On this slide, we have Nellie Zabel Wilhite. Around the age of two, she became deaf. But later in her 30s, she decided to become a pilot and indeed got her pilot's license. As you can imagine, it took lots of training and practice flights, but she's the first deaf woman to fly solo. Next, we have Dr. Shirley Allen. She became deaf at the age of 20. And she is notable for being the first deaf African-American woman to receive her PhD. Dr. Nathie Marbury, the first black deaf person to teach in some schools. And as many of you know, very well known ASL professor and storyteller. This is Victoria Monroe. Victoria is black, deaf, and queer, and founded the Transformative Deaf Education Organization. It is a nonprofit that aims to promote the practice of social justice, in deaf education and other deaf programs. This is Sarah Young Bear Brown. She's the first deaf Meskawaki woman activist. She did protest with the no DAPL. She is a Native American and has been involved with supporting missing indigenous women. Next, we have Jeanette Duran Aguirre. She is a deaf Mexican who advocates for deaf education. This is Haven Gurma. Haven is a black deaf blind woman who is one of the first known deaf blind people to graduate from Harvard Law School. She now works as an advocate for equal opportunities for people with disabilities. Claudia Gordon. Claudia is a black deaf woman and one of the first known black deaf women uh, who actually worked for President Obama as an attorney on staff for eight years. Joanna Luke, first deaf female engineer who works in NASA's mission control. Leah Katz Hernandez. Leah was one of the first deaf persons to work at the White House. She was a West Wing receptionist there and has advocated for equal access for deaf people with disabilities and the Latina communities. Roberta Cordano. She's the first deaf woman and openly gay female to be president of Gallaudet University. Now, deaf woman facts.
And now let me introduce the five women joining our panel this evening. Well, I hope you enjoyed the PowerPoint. Now I'll make true introductions. I'll begin with Anna R.C. Hello, hello. Thank you for joining us this evening. I do have questions prepared for all of our panelists. Ask these things. Born and raised. Not your family. Hello, my name is Anna. I am from the Philippines. Uh, our signing is much different. This sign that I just showed you means excited. I am excited to be here. As I mentioned, I was born and raised in the Philippines. I am deaf uh, and I identify as female. I do use ASL here in America, but Filipino sign language uh, back home. I also can read and write both English and a Filipino language. I have often been asked to interpret actually between those two languages and have done so at conferences. Now I did graduate from De La Salle College of St. Benilde in the Philippines. And I'm currently Associate Professor of Deaf Education and Deaf Studies. I am one of the first to graduate with a college degree here in my home country where I grew up. And I've had opportunities to share my voice with others. And I always like to advocate for women so that they know that they can do anything. Being deaf, being Filipino does not limit you from accomplishing your goals. Now, I was very fortunate um, that I was able to, through the World Deaf Leadership Organization, compete for a scholarship to attend Gallaudet University. There were only going to be two students chosen, and I was chosen by the World WDL. Uh, for that scholarship, which was great. Very exciting for me because I'm also uh, the first Filipino to win that war award. Um, I studied deaf culture and deaf studies. And then of course came back here to my home in the Philippines so that I could work at the college here. Thank you so much. Jesse, will you introduce yourself?
Good evening, everyone. My name is Jessie. I am from the upstate New York area, moved to the Maryland area, graduated, and of course, looked to Gallaudet, graduated there, and then returned to work. I do have two deaf children. I do work for Sorensen as well, and I've been there for approximately 15 years. Um, one of the call centers directors and just really, really loved that job, realizes that I wanted a little bit more. I mean, I also wanted to give back to the community. So I know as interpreters, we struggle sometimes for doctor's appointments and having meetings and counseling and having no interpreters, things of that nature. And so, you know, wanting to advocate for interpreters, and that was part of my desire. So I got involved with Sorensen. That's a little bit about who I am, and possibly I'll share more with you later. Excellent. Next, Yvonne Black. Let's see, how do I turn this off? Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Yvonne Black. I was born and raised in Arkansas. I am the only deaf person in my family. I do have four brothers and a hearing sister. They, my, my sister can fingerspell a little bit, but um, really no one communicates using sign language. I did uh, an, uh, attend a deaf school there in Arkansas. First group of back cribs that were mainstreamed in that state, state after the time, the period of segregation. And with us being Main Street, we had the separate dorms, though we do also have, uh, let's see, I learned ASL there. After about two weeks. Graduated high school and headed for Gallaudet University. Got my bachelor's in psychology and then went back to the Arkansas School for the Deaf to work, but really faced a lot of blockades. They were hiring, but they were not hiring women of color. And so I returned to Maryland, took my master's work there, there at, Gall at Gallaudet again, graduated looked for a job, went to NTID, uh, went to v uh, Alabama, worked in the VR system. And life was just moving forward, got my master's, moved forward, and worked as part of the um, accessibility office there. Yeah. All righty, good evening, everyone. My name is Milani. This is my sign name. I'm not sure why that is my sign name, but it was the name I was born deaf. When my parents found out that I was deaf, I was about five months old. The doctor informed them that they did have uh, deaf schools there in New York. And so that's where I was raised. And my parents decided to place me in school there. I was about two and a half, three years old. Did not know anything about sign language until I entered school. Mm -hmm. And so I told them what my name was. The teacher was trying to read lips and I was trying to read her lips. and. <laughs> And so she told me how to read my name on other people's lips. 
there were a couple of other students there that were oral <laughs> and they told me how to pronounce my name and thought it was a beautiful name. And so I'm about two and a half when I entered the school system. There were two different programs at the time. There was a total communication program and an oral program. And so there I was up until about eighth grade, I was in the WORM program and learned to sign. Now understand that both my parents are hearing. And this is back in the 1970s. So I can remember learning through the old fashioned reels, film, learning language that way about three or four years old. I do have a younger sister and um, they were placed in school as well. We learned to sign, we, we did co total communication at home. We did a little bit of English at home. Uh, my family immigrated from Trinidad so we are, I mean, we are national, nationally recognized as Indians, but they immigrated here. And as a family, we were able to com communicate. Graduated from school, attended Gallaudet University. A business degree in, in business administration is what I graduated with. Went back to New York City after I graduated Gallaudet, and I've been there ever since, been active in the community, advocacy type work, uh, working with those that are from other countries and would like to immigrate, and, uh, and they are deaf. There are several uh, that work with me that uh, work with us now at the deaf program so that we are able to empower our deaf students. I, I do travel a little bit and lecture. And I do love history. And so I tell the story, I'm a storyteller. I tell the stories of our culture, our background as deaf people and just advocate within the deaf community. There's a web series that we've been working on with regards to deafness and uh, we're developing a YouTube channel out of that as well. And so being able to hire deaf actors and deaf producers to work together as a collaborative. And it has been very successful at this time. I'm the, the director for the CSD program and uh, I'm living in New York City. Thank you so much for sharing. And next we have Norma Moran. Hello. Yes, we can see you. Go ahead. Well, hi. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Norma Moran. I live in the DC area. I actually live about 20 miles outside of DC in Maryland. Uh, I was actually born in another country. And when that country was in civil war, um, my family realized it was not safe for us. So we moved to Guatemala and then made it through Mexico and ended up in California after we crossed uh, the border. Now my father, he was in Reno, Nevada. And he got settled there and then brought over my mother. And that's where I read the rest of my family was born. Now, of course, 
growing up in the 80s, I had total communication, amplification, more hearing aids, you see, went to uh, several youth camps in Fremont, California, uh, with the other students from Fremont School for the Deaf, as well as students uh, from Las Vegas, which was the school that I attended. I was exposed at California School for the Deaf where I learned more ASL, uh, but it wasn't until I attended RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology and TID where I truly fell in love with ASL. After I graduated, I decided to volunteer for the Peace Corps and went to Kenya, Africa for three years. I taught deaf children there at the deaf school. Uh, it's a very small village, city, if you will. Well, the largest city was about six hours away. And I loved my work there. I was only committed to stay uh, two years, but I didn't want to leave. So I stayed for an additional year. And those three years were a very rich experience that really shaped who I am today. I am a stay-at-home mother with three children. My oldest is a coda, hearing the younger two are deaf. Uh, so of course, my life has shifted quite a bit as deaf parents with deaf children uh, and hearing children. It's a new experience, parenting all together. Once my third one was child was born, that's when I decided to leave my work and stay at home and raise my family. And so right now, um, I'm doing some contracting work uh, with other organizations like this one. And I'm again, so thrilled to be a part of your panel. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next question. And this is for everyone. What do you like best about being a woman? And what do you like the least? <laughs> we will start with Anna. Well, I do consider myself uh, a beautiful. Uh, I, I, am, I identify as female. I do know that there are some um, limitations that have traditionally been placed on women, but really women can do almost anything, if not everything a man can do. But sometimes the roles uh, have tried to influence females and their identity where they should be or should work um, I'm proud to be a female. I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, now, I know that uh, in the hearing community, there are many role models, successful hearing women, and I see the same in the deaf community. Uh, now, some would say it's, you know, it's hard being a woman, you know, childbirth, uh, having a menstrual cycle, but really, uh, these experiences as a woman make us stronger. And women are stronger, at least I think so. That's how I view myself. And I think for any deaf woman out there, you can do anything. You can succeed whatever your dreams and goals are, whether it's professional, personal, a promotion you want, go for it. I know many people often think that deaf women are at a disadvantage. And I don't think that's the case. I think that uh, we can be competitive. I'm an equestrian myself. Uh, equestrian is actual horses that jump and do certain tricks with their handler. And I was the only deaf female uh, in the equestrian competitions. Many, many other hearing females there. And I'm sure uh, some of them thought that I wouldn't be able to compete at the same level. And there was one Hispanic female as well. And I noticed uh, we began talking first and she actually came to me with a sign language book, a British sign language, BSL. Um, but was we were really trying to figure out uh, how we could communicate 
with the equestrian program. And I ended up having to come up with signs that would help all of us to communicate. Now, I eventually, uh, I was taking classes and was in training with the horses so that I could compete at a higher level. And when it came down to the practical test, uh, when you actually show the horses, I remember getting all suited up, geared up, and my instructor said, are, are you ready for your comp? It's time to test all of your the equestrian skills. Uh, so there's a performance piece and a, a written piece. And I was, uh, I, I went first. I just decided, okay, I'll go first. <laughs> and uh, I did. I went out there and my presentation was perfect. And I don't know if they were expecting me to have more errors uh, than the others because I was deaf, but no, <laughs> my performance was flawless and I was very pleased. Uh, I was proud of myself. I, I do always think of you know those experiences, including my own, so that I can be a role model and really advocate and encourage females. You can compete at any level, just like I did. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jesse, would you like to answer that? Wow. I was watching the story as she told it and thank you so much for sharing. I love being a woman, I do. My mom, myself, my daughter, three generations of deaf women, my mom went through a lot and I watched her go through things. And then I remember being a young independent young woman and now I'm looking at my daughter, but it's, you know, it's not just me, it's my grandmom, it's my mom, and we are all watching her grow now. This is the third generation of deaf women. How special is that? And so we watch the stories, we look at the challenges, we look at the frustrations that they've experienced. And I always let my daughter know, you're going to do better than I did. You're going to do better. And so when I look at her, she is going to do better. There are challenges. Yes, there are. But the challenges are getting less compared to my mom's time, compared to my time. She's going through fewer challenges. You know, with regards to salary, with regards to her identity, with regards to, I remember my mom telling me, I know you're deaf, but be quiet. Don't, you know, you're going to be quiet, fired if you, if you speak out. That was her time. I remember being a little bit scared to speak out. And then I got over that. I started negotiating for higher salary and negotiating for my rights. And there was a, several mentors, several strong women that stood their ground and talked to me and showed me how to negotiate for that higher salary. And so now I'm teaching my daughter, get out there, you stand for yourself. She's like, well, 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 you know, and I'm a little bit in the middle because I'm half mom, of course. Uh, I'm a little bit scared, but then I want to see her succeed. And so I'm standing proudly between the two standing in the gap between my mom and between my daughter. I'm proud of myself. Being a woman in this generation is amazing. It's a special time, a unique time. We're in the middle of transition. Things are not the same as they've always been. We recognize that things are changing. Like I said, I can look to my grandmother, my mother, myself, and my daughter. You know, it's been such a process. When I unpack all that has happened, all the things that have been passed down, and then she will pass it on to the future. Being a woman, being a female at this time of life is amazing. Thank you. Yes, I agree, definitely. Okay, Yvonne. Okay, wow. 
Hello, everyone, again. What do I like about being a woman? Wow. We have so many, so much flexibility with regards to clothing and shoes and jewelry and accessories. And, you know, we could put a rose in our hair and put our lipstick on and make sure we are all matched and all very, very creative in our dress. We cook, we, we have gone through a lot of pain. We have. You know, you barely get a small cut. A man would be so hurt and torn by that. Not women, we keep going. We handle pain. We handle struggles better than men do. As a black woman, that's a whole other ball game. Flexibility with hair. We can go curly, we can go long, we can go short. We have full lips. We have hips that are wide. I'm telling you, I love you know mixing it up with colors you go out you tan you go in you get lighter but being female that's the beauty of being female we can do boots if we would like to we can do sandals if we need to if there's something that i would say i do not like being female Having to deal with glass ceilings, having to struggle, having to fight for the same positions as a man has, having to be satisfied with lesser salary, thinking that, oh, men are more intelligent than females, having our emotions looked down, down on and joked about, oh, she has PMS. Always having to, oh, your opinion of me is not correct. No, your opinion of me is wrong. Having to always prove who we are and where we are. There's so much that goes with that, but I still love being a woman. I can remember back in the day of having menstrual cycles and the things that that limited me and the things that I could not do. But think about the fact that as a woman, I carry a baby. I bond with it before anyone else do. I could not ask for I couldn't ask God for anything more than this, than simply to be a woman. Oh, thank you so much for that. And then wearing the flower in your hair. <laughs> I know that's one of your trademarks, like Rosa. <laughs> Next, Melanie. Could you, would you mind repeating that question for me again? Of course I can. What do you like about being a woman? What do you like and what do you least like? <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you, I got you. Thank you. What do I like about being a woman? Hmm. I'm a little bit like Yvonne, all that she said, that's me. I feel the flexibility. I can do pants. I can do dresses. I can change my shoes. I can do boots. I, you know, sometimes I change it up because of where I am. 
Now understand, I have this four of us, there's five of us girls in my family. I have four sisters. My yeah. parents are all hearing, of course, and there's a set of twins in there. And then there's me as being deaf. But all of us, we are strong women. My parents raised five strong women. My mom was not the one. She was a very strict. She was very big on advocating for us and us advocating for ourselves. She was very independent, did not want to depend on a man. And so she taught that to us as far as getting her job and earning money. She taught us how to do that for ourselves, got her education and then earned her own money. That I learned that from my mom. I learned that growing up. Strong women, athletic women. We were able to be part of everything. We traveled a lot and we saw our mom. My mom was kind of the heart of our family. She's the one that got on to us. She's the one that kept us up in school. She did all of that and more. You know, there are times, of course, our clothing costs more than the boys did and so on. But so she was wise with her budget. She made her money stretch because, again, she had five girls. I watched that. And so now I know that I can do it. I watched the other strong women while I was at the university. I saw other women that was able to my professors. Most of them were women. And so that inspired me. If they did it, I could. And so I had good role models, deaf professors. I remember Yvonne there at Gallaudet University. I looked up to her. Deaf club, she was the only, um, at that level, she was the only black deaf person in, as part of the club. So that inspired me to try. The only thing I don't like about being female or woman is like Yvonne said, the menstrual cycle, but that's, that's not, I mean, I just, I'm comfortable being who I am. Uh, there are challenges, of course, to face, facing the workplace. Uh, white male dominated companies are the hardest. As I've seen, you know, times where change needs to happen. And it is happening. It, I mean, we are in 2021 right now and the world is changing. But the web deaf world seems to be changing a little bit slower than everything else, but it is changing. But we are having wonderful female leaders in this organ in organization that can hire other female leaders. I'm not saying that we get rid of men, but I'm saying that we can work together. We can accomplish a lot. I guess in a nutshell, that's kind of it. I love being a woman. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll turn it over to Norma. Hi. I think Yvonne took a lot of the same answers I would want to, to go with. I think with uh, me, I've got my oldest is a girl and then I have a boy. I have always thought that shopping for the girls was easier. Um, and there's always plenty of variety in sizes, but I noticed with my boys, it was much harder. You know, for example, at Walmart, and if you're thinking of infant clothes through toddler, there's so many cute clothes for the baby girls, all of the pink rows and aisles, but very limited choices for the boys. Um, but, maybe that makes up for all of the other barriers that we face in society as females uh, being a woman i love the gift of being a mother um i actually now appreciate my mother 
for what she gave me, I am able to now enjoy the gift of motherhood because of the gift that was given to her. Uh, the one thing I least like is, as several have mentioned, the glass ceiling, having to work three, four times as harder than men, um, and that equity not being there. I know that also with uh, police officers, I don't know if it's tone of voice or their body language, but I often feel like that some policemen uh, <laughs> look at me and I don't know, it's it, it could be called RBF, resting bitch face. Okay, maybe I do, but when someone asks me what is wrong, I immediately want to question why they're judging me. Am I supposed to always be smiling? I've also been called like an ice princess that I'm not very warm. Again, what makes people form those opinions, uh, men that is, form these opinions and pass judgment on women when they don't do that to each other? I think also with my culture growing up in Latin American culture, uh, there are high expectations for women. They are supposed to take care of the household. They're supposed to cook and clean and stay at home where men can do whatever they want. They have more of a decision in what they would like to do uh, when they become adults. And so that's just one of many things. But in general, I do love being a woman. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I see that uh, we are cutting it close on time. So I'd like to ask this question. If you could change anything to better yourself or benefit women, just change our world for a better one, what would you change and why? And then lastly, name a deaf woman you admire and why you chose that person. I'll start with Anna. Uh, it is a two-pronged question. So what would I change in the world? I would definitely would like to see more deaf women in leadership, especially here in the Philippines. I'd like to see more women in leadership. Uh, but not only that, um, since uh, many of us have been home and isolated from society for so long, uh, it's it's nice. I'd like to see that change in the Philippines for more women to be uh, in leadership roles. The second part of your question, I don't know if any of you know Dr. Laureen Sims. I would have to name her. She does work at Gallaudet University. And when I was in graduate school, I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Laureen Sims at Gallaudet and saw many of her lectures and presentations. She is a huge uh, advocate for social justice and is a female, but not only that, there are many identities. Uh, she's an advocate. Uh, and I know here in the Philippines, um, you know, we've got Filipino sign language as well as Filipino written spoken language. And so I know that was just my passion when I was at Gallaudet after meeting Dr. Laureen Sims, I wanted to be like her and come back and really be a change for social justice for women in the Philippines, but also our language. Um, not that uh, there's anything wrong with signing, like signing exact English or signing exact Filipino, but in terms of just language, it's more education, uh, not teaching just signed English, but really providing more access for all, I think, bottom line. And Dr. Lauren Sims really inspired me. She made an impact on my life. And I think literacy is so important, especially in education. Thank you so much, Anna. Jesse.
Yes. Okay. Could, if I could change anything, it would be more women becoming mentors for younger women. I've had some wonderful mentors that have really been instrumental in exposing me to so much and to challenging us. I think that will be great. I've had the opportunity to mentor a few women myself. I invited them to be part of my life, to watch me work as I face challenges. I just opened the door for them and so that they can see how they, it's to be done. And we need more and more mentors that move up the ladder, move on in life, older mentors looking for special people, unique women who really want to make a difference in their the place where they have been set. How do you mentor? How do you invite them in? How do you talk with them? How do you give feedback? I picked up a lot from those that mentored me. They've showed me how to make it. I think that's important. Mentorship. I mean, just in my own life, I've seen women that have stayed in a job 25, 30 years, and I listen to what they say, and I tell them, I mean, you can, they told me, no, you can do something different than I did. You don't have to stay in a job 25 years. You can do different. And I'm teaching my daughter that she can do different. I've really made these things that I have been taught part of my life. I'm teaching her how to speak up for herself. I mean, I've had some wonderful mentors that have really helped me. Thank you so much. Next, let's hear from Yvonne Black. Okay, wow. If I could change anything, I believe I'm already doing this in part, but I'd like to do more. I'd like for women to come in consort. Let me give you a little story. A couple of years ago, I got a check for $3,000. I had worked hard for it. And I thought, I, you know, we need leadership in the world of deafness. So I thought, I'm going to give this $3,000 to someone else. Because $3,000 in U.S. currency is maybe $20,000 in African currency. And so we put together a conference that I thought it would be great if we could have these women come and be taught, African women, Spanish women, Asian women, anybody that would be want to be taught and trained. Now understand, this can be a threat to manhood as we know it. but. It does not have to, I'm trying to tell, say that it does not have to be that way. We look at people like Oprah Winfrey. She, she donates quite a bit of aid to different countries in Africa. I'm thinking we could do something like that for deaf women. I would like for us to be able to come together and do that for us as deaf women. Of course, have men support the effort, but have it be spearheaded by us so that change can be brought about. A deaf woman that I would look at, to, oh, there's so many that I look up to, so many women of color. There is one in particular, Nathie, Dr. Nathie Murbury. Her and I, her ex-husband was my uh, boyfriend for uh, several years and we became friends later in life and I looked up to her so much. Like I said, we became friends and she just was wonderful for me, to me. Thank you for sharing that, Yvonne. That, that was a cool little tidbit or fact. Melanie.
All righty, I had to unmute myself. There's a couple of things that I would change if I could. I'm, I, I hate to even say this. One, have no rules when it comes to food. I could eat anything. Okay, you don't have to watch your weight. You don't have to watch calories and all of the other things that goes with that. If there's one thing I could change, I would change the rules concerning food. But as far as the women of the world, I would like the idea of empowering them more. But just not just women, but women of color, men of color, so that they learn to respect each other, mutual respect, learning to work together as equals. I think that'll be key in changing our world. Teaching the students to respect teachers, teachers respect students. I think that'll be great. Not just having to look at history and see that men oppressed and suppressed so much that women were doing and women were forced to accept it as normal. I think that needs to change. And I think the key to it is mutual respect. Inspect, respecting people as individuals, look at who they are as humans, not just putting labels on them, but just as humans. And because you're human, you could do this, you can do that. Supporting each other, I think that will change the world. Who as a deaf woman would I look up to? I've got quite a list myself. I remember being a kid, learning a lot for, about Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad and the freeing of, of, of slaves. I think that's one I would, look, I would love to meet and look up to. Uh, CJ Walters, I think she said. I think that's another one that I would look up to. I just recently learned about her and uh, was inspired by her story. More and more women in various fields, uh, aeronautics, rocket science, those women really inspire me. It's, it puts me on the right track to see that. Women as leaders, presidents of countries. We have our very own vice president at this time. I think that'll change the world. I think those are women that I would look up to. Thank you so much. Okay, we have Norma next. Wow, many of you have already mentioned so many things that I also would love to see change uh, in terms of women. Um, with our society and, uh, and government here and around the world, I think providing women the right to health care, especially pregnancy and the paid maternity leave, uh, especially for working women. Maybe you could do, uh, you know, more of those leaves for maternity or using sick time. Women in the workforce often are penalized, if you will, having to use their own paid time off. Uh, to take care of just basic family needs. Uh, I know there's like uh, FMLA, the Family Medical and Leave Act, but I could see more change if we could improve that. Um, of course, I would love to see uh, change in society in their treatment of women, uh, specifically just in schools, how we even raise our boys into men in this society. We don't need that hashtag me too. We just, that speaks volumes to how we need to change how women are perceived. As far as products, feminine products for women, right? Why do we, why are they so costly? Uh, why do we have to pay for products 
you know, for our menstrual cycle. <laughs> I do, though, want to mention the woman I look up to the most, Julie Talbot Means. Uh, she and I were both pregnant at the same time. We met in school and I know that we were both getting our PhDs at the same time. And uh, she was just so inspiring and supportive of me. And we were to each other during that time. Wow, I just want to thank you all for this lovely event. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. I do want to thank the interpreters again uh, for taking the time to interpret this event. And of course, we could not do this without the women that participate in the panel. Special thanks to Deaf Literacy Center, the University of Florida Signing Gators. Thank you for making this event happen. And then all of us that joined us on Facebook Live tonight, our viewers, thank you for watching. Good night. I have been told I can open up these last few minutes uh, for any viewers that would like to ask questions. We could do a brief Q&A. One other thing. Before we close, do any of the women on the panel have questions, maybe, hmm, I'm trying to look at Facebook Live, but since we can't really take questions from them, do you have any last comments, anything you'd like to say? Uh, yes, go ahead, um, Melanie. For both the women and the men, don't be afraid to ask for help. Never be afraid to ask for advice, for counsel. I think that is so important because once you ask, you will make it through, you can. Okay, anyone else? Go ahead, Yvonne. Wow. My advice to everyone, beautiful women that are out there, deaf women specifically, love yourself. Go on and love yourself. Not allowing anybody to define who you are. You have no need to do that. Be who you are. And for the men out there as well, if you love yourself, that's great. Love your wife too, your sister, your mom. With all your might, support them. Deaf women, go on. Go on. I dare you. I double dog dare you to dream big, set some goals for yourself, be you. Peace out. Any last thoughts? Yes, I, I, I would like to mention when it comes to just communicating with Asian Americans, Asian people in general, do not be afraid. Um, I think that with COVID recently, um, we've seen a lot of change 
and how we socialize. But uh, I told you, I, I often bridge communication uh, between other deaf Filipino women like myself and hearing people. I, I'm, I'm not afraid to jump right in there and really facilitate communication. Uh, you know how deaf people are so adept with their visual acuity and their, you know, eye contact is so important. So these are things that we can just simply help by educating hearing people uh, not to be afraid uh, that uh, we can we can meet you halfway. Yes. And for women, especially deaf women, don't let that hold you back. Don't be afraid. Get involved. Okay. Oh, anyone else? Norma, go ahead. I did want to share um, this trendy word right now. It's the beautiful, B-E-Y, U-T-I-F-U-L, yes, beautiful, B-U-Y-O-U. Jesse, did you want to mention something? I think we're just waiting for the camera. I love each of you, your stories, all oh, be you and not let anything stop you. You do not have to hesitate, go for it, especially today. There's so much that we can challenge and but we, we, you don't wanna hold back. I love Yvonne's words to us, be you. We are women, I mean, let it roar. Let it come out of us, yeah. Love you guys. Thank you so much. Be you, absolutely. I really am so thrilled that we were able to do this event virtually tonight. And the women on this panel, thank you for being here. And everyone in the community, all of our viewers, I know they are equally as inspired and appreciative. So with that, be you. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, just thank you, Astonishing Women, for coming today and sharing your stories and just for your time today. As a deaf young woman myself, it's you're an inspiration. You, you really forced me to be myself in this. There's so many deaf women out there and people out there in the world that need that. Thank you so much. Thank you audience for coming and in your time to be here. We will post on YouTube after we make um, some edits. Might take a few days. Thank you for the wonderful interpreters and the UF, uh, UF and DLC for their support. Remember next week we have an, another event We have another Deaf History event, Peter Keen, I believe. It will be posted, um, advertised. Peter Oak, Oak, my apologies. Thank you. Thank you so much for tonight, love you guys. <laughs>